Hello, uh, welcome everyone to our online meetup of Magenta Codes. Uh, first steps for interview prep and open source. So we are very glad today to introduce you to two very uh, amazing women that contribute actively to increase our, part our participation in tech. Oh, I don't know if you guys are seeing. Yeah, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, first of all, we must remind you to our code of conduct, so please keep your microphone muted at all times. After each talk, uh, we will have a five-minute space for questions for our speakers, so please feel free to do them through our chat. And at the end, we will formulate the questions for them. Uh, because this is an, a, an event, an online event, we, re we expect that everyone communicate in a respectful and constructive manner. So, please... Uh, Feel free to chat and to give us our suggestions, but in a respectful way. The last part is our legal consent. So the talk is being recorded to distribute and run our social media. When you register and participate in our events, you are agreeing that your image, name, or audio can be used. So if you do not agree and you want to be excluded of this, please or turn off your camera, your microphone, and let us know through, uh, through our email, Hi Magenta Codes. So uh, we also invite you to share your experience of today and inspire all other women. So remember to mention us at Magenta Codes and also Women Tech Makers with the hashtag more women in tech and more women in open source through Twitter, Instagram, and Meetup. Okay, so everyone that has agreed to let us use your image or name can uh, turn on your camera and let's take a group photo. We are breaking down barriers, so a good photo will remind us uh, of that. Let me just uh, stop presenting for a moment so we can all be here. <laughs> and yeah, Ja, let me know if you're ready. <laughs> done? Yes, done. Perfect. Let me go back here okay so this is the schedule for today we will have a small intro about ourselves uh, then we will have our two talks preparing preparing for the while and an open source what what why and taking your first steps and last we will have some closing remarks so who are we uh, my name is alejandra ferreira uh, and I am part of the, the founders here at Magenta Codes. And this is the rest of the team that is making this possible. So this is Dunia Rivas, Joana Salinas, and Luisa Giraldo. And you can contact them through their social media. Don't be shy. Uh, don't be afraid. They are really uh, tech enthusiasts, and they will be very glad to chat with you. So um, how this community started? Uh, we got together and exchanged some ideas and saw some challenges that we were facing as technology beginners, and especially in a new country where we did not speak the language. So now we created a community with initiatives of inclusion, support, development, and gender equality in this current technological climate and revolution. So this is also in alignment with the UN Sustainability Development, development Goals, <laughs> and specifically the goal number five related to gender equality. And currently, we are, all, we are also under the wings of Women Tech Makers, uh, which is a Google's community that supports we, uh, women in the tech ecosystem. <laughs> so uh, our first talk, uh, it's called Preparing for the Wild. In today's crowded job market, it's really important to set yourself apart. This talk is going to allow us to explore that and how to take those first steps to stand out and capture attention and minimize those chances, those chances of rejection. It would also include some tips and techniques on salary negotiations, interview preparation, and beyond. And here to present is Ellie King. She has over seven years of technology recruitment experience, and she's actively supporting Scandinavian companies. She's also helping their teams grow and She's also in, a, in diversity missions. Ellie is truly in a mission to create a diverse data-driven universe. So Ellie, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. This stage is yours. <laughs> Perfect. 
Let me just get ready to share my screen with you all. Right, can everyone see my screen? Perfect. Perfect. So welcome to my presentation, Preparing for the Wild. Um, where did the name fr come from? Well, right now it's a bit of a jungle in the job market at the moment. It's very crowded. There's a lot of uncertainty. So I think wild is probably a good term for the, the current state of affairs and the situation that we're in. So before we get started, who am I? So um, I've been doing IT recruitment for over seven years now within Europe. I actually started my career working in the German markets and then moved over to Scandinavia, where I really fell in love with Scandinavian culture. I am a huge diversity and inclusion advocate, and I'm really supporting businesses with their diversity missions, really to help build more ethical and successful culture. On top of that, I've also founded a monthly Q&A initiative where we speak with influential women in tech. We share stories, the career journeys, the lessons learned, the challenges had, really to help inspire and encourage more women in the industry. So I'll share some more details with you after the presentation, but also I've um, had the pleasure of lecturing at Hyper Island University in Stockholm, hosted and attended many different meetups, and a fun fact, I'm a huge Harry Potter and a travel addict. Of course, the travel element right now is a, uh, on hold, but the Harry Potter certainly isn't. There's been a lot of movie marathons in lockdown. So before we get into the presentation, I want everyone to do a little exercise. And this is all about self-reflection. And this is something that we can do when we're looking for a new job or at any point in our career. So if you have a pen and paper, fantastic. If not, just give this some thought and then I'd love you to do this later and feel free to reach out to me um, directly and, and let me know how this goes. So put pen to paper and I want you to list two or three of your strengths, the areas in which you feel you could improve, what your values really are, and also what gives you fulfillment and enjoyment when it comes to your career and the things that you do. So take some time to put that pen to paper. And then following that, I want you to really take some time to visualize. Visualize what your perfect working environment looks like, your day-to-day -day responsibilities, and also the direction you want your career to head, both professionally and personally. Really give that some thought. So I'll give you a few minutes just to have a think about these things. Okay, perfect. So with that in mind, I want to talk to you first and foremost about personal brand. And this is something that now more than ever is so important to set you aside from, like we said, what is a very crowded market. So firstly, I just want to share a quote with you from uh, Jeff Bezos, Amazon CEO. Your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. So the importance of working on this, like we said, it's going to help you stand out from the crowd. It's going to really give you some focus in your career. It's going to help you to become an expert in your field and someone that people respect. It opens up so many opportunities for you. And also it gives you the opportunity to really take a deep look at yourself and understand your strengths and your weaknesses. So if you're going to work on your personal brand, I like to say that you have to almost be an octopus. You need many different arms. You need to have uh, be involved in many different elements and you have to be proactive. You have to come out of your comfort zone, really have the confidence to network, to get speaking with people, have conversations with people that maybe you wouldn't necessarily do so. And you have to be consistent with the things that you do and always have the long game in mind. Maybe some of the things that you work on for your personal brand, you won't see any benefit from straight away, but the more you do it, the more recognition you're going to get and the more that you're going to be recognized. So I wanna share with you a few things that you can do to work on your personal brand that, that are going to really make you stand out to any employer. Firstly, what you're doing right now is fantastic, attending meetups, 
This is an incredible way to really network, to learn and engage. It gives you the chance to really exchange ideas, share some of the challenges that you're currently facing and hopefully uncover some solutions along the way as well. On top of that, it gives you the chance to stay on top of the latest trends in your industry, the latest announcements, and you can really start to become recognized. If you are continually going to these same events, you're going to be a familiar face. Why don't you even try and see if you can do some volunteering in any way? And again, that's going to help you, your brand, your recognition, and it gives you the chance to come out of your comfort zone. Maybe even look to make a presentation at one of these events as well. Typically, um, without the pandemic, some of these events are going to be hosted at your comp the companies that may be on your top three companies to work for list as well. So it's a great opportunity for you to actually go to their offices, see it in real life, um, meet some of their staff, get networking with some of their employees as well. And the great thing about meetups, I guess, in person is most of the time you get a lot of free pizza. Uh, pizza always tastes great when it's free. But more importantly, with taking things virtual, you can still do a lot of these things. So the events that you attend, reach out to the hosts, ask if you can get a list of all of the people attending, and then follow up with these people on social networks. Get speaking with them, post about the events that you're attending. Again, let people know that you're going to these things, that you're actively working on your personal brand, and that you're very interested in your personal development. Here's some advice I wanted to share with you from some developers, uh, from some head of analytics who always attend different uh, meetups, whether that be virtual or face-to-face, -face, but really just to break down the stigma for you. So get involved in the community, be proactive, look to volunteer at different events and build your network. Come out of your comfort zone, more importantly. Also connect with the speakers. Do not be scared. I'm sure if you approach any of the speakers at any events, um, they'll be more than happy to help. I know I would be after this, uh, this presentation. If you like their talks, tell them that. Start a conversation with them. And they can help you get connected with other people and give you tips. You get to know people by talking, so don't be afraid. Another really great piece of advice is from a head of analytics that I work with. And they can recommend a, a meetup group that isn't necessarily technology focused, but it's called Stockholm Tech Meetup. Now, this is a monthly startup event where founders um, meet at the event and they pitch investors live on stage. So you have the opportunity to really be around a lot of entrepreneurs, fantastic people in technology, all underneath one roof. And they also make announcements on different technologies and initiatives that are impacting the community. So so going to events like this as well are going to help you get one step ahead of the curve. Like I said, you know, from the head of analytics, the networking possibilities are endless. Someone that they made a connection with through this group, actually it led them to securing their job as head of analytics in a company that wasn't even advertising for the position. So again, this goes to show what having these kind of conversations can lead to opens up a world of opportunities. Secondly, upskilling and hobby projects. Now, this is an incredible opportunity for you to really give tangible examples to companies of the work that you're doing outside of just your day-to-day, -day, whether that be in certain projects and technologies that you're really excited about, that you really want to improve yourself on. But working on all of these different projects is going to benefit yourself as well, right? And like I said, it shows your potential employer how committed and passionate you actually are. Investing these extra hours shows that you're willing to go the extra mile for an organization and this also could have a really positive reflection on the potential salary that you could achieve at an organization I think it's important though to again have a bit of a focus on the projects that you want to do I think it's great to work on so many different things but having that focus having that specialism is going to show your potential employer that you know what you want to achieve and again that links back to the first exercise we've done on self-reflection but having personal projects now more than ever are really going to help you stand out and don't be afraid to shout about them through your social media panels volunteering is also another way that can really help you stand out at the moment 
Again, it also makes you very much recognized in the community. It gives you not only career, but personal fulfillment, genuinely helping people. And it highlights your commitment to initiatives that you feel passionate about. Organizations are gonna be looking at this. And again, gonna be seeing that you're willing to invest your free time into helping other people and going the extra mile. So it gives you the great opportunity to also meet new people at these different programs. And that can open up, again, a whole uh, different realm of opportunities, whether that be mentorship possibilities, whether that be new job opportunities, the heads up on positions, again, that aren't being advertised. Maybe you could set up your own um, initiative, something that you're really passionate about. And again, that gives you the recognition. So I'm just sharing with you a few here. Um, Pink programming is, is fantastic, encouraging young kids to um, get involved in coding. Hack Your Future is a really great web development program for talented refugees and other disadvantaged groups. So there's some really great ones out there. I highly recommend just trying to reach out to these um, organizers. And like I say, they'll be more than willing to have a conversation with you. Now, social platforms and creating content. Again, this is building up your portfolio when it comes to applying for a job. Find your voice and you have to be consistent with this. So join relevant groups on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, on any social platform that you can, groups that you're passionate about, that you feel you can contribute things towards. And don't be afraid of sharing content. Don't hold back. I think sometimes we shy away from that because we're too scared of what people think. Um, I know that I did, but now I've started to release video content and lots of different uh, articles, and I'm really seeing the benefits of it. So I can tell you firsthand that it's really been benefiting me and my own personal brand. But why not create a blog post series, something that you're passionate about, whether that be diversity and inclusion, whether that be mindfulness, whether that be technology-wise, and also look to create video content. Make yourself a familiar face to the community. LinkedIn is a great way to be connected and share ideas with many different people. And this could again lead to some fantastic opportunities for you. And really make sure you're posting about all of the events that you're attending. So after this event, post about it. Maybe do a summary of the things that you've taken away, the, the top three things you've learned. Let people know that, again, you're working on yourself constantly. But with this, I think you have to have the long game in mind. Doing a few posts, you won't become an overnight success. Um, hopefully you will be, great, but it does take time and it does take consistency. But doing these things, you'll become such a recognized figure that companies will start seeing what you're about, seeing your social platforms. And again, this gives you a really competitive edge to other people who aren't doing this. Like I say, companies will check your social platforms. And again, you're adding value to people and to yourself because creating this content, it is coming out of your comfort zone. It's really opening up your creativity as well. Now, following on from that, working on personal brand, I wanna talk a little bit about job descriptions. Um, research shows that women don't apply for jobs unless they're 100% qualified for a role, while apparently men apply for them if they meet 60% of the requirements. Now, if we think about that, I can definitely relate, um, but here's a quote from a CTO that I work with. So it's always nice to find someone with the perfect experience of our stack, but what's more important is a humble and curious mindset. If you do not know something, are you the type of person who wants to learn? Are you working on personal projects? If so, that would also be interesting. So I wanted to share that with you to really come away from this stigma that women only apply if they're 100% qualified. I think the most important thing when it comes to job descriptions is do not stress about being the perfect fit. Does the perfect fit even exist? As long as you're working on yourself and doing other things outside of just what the job description entails, you know, your personal brand work, personal projects, that's also gonna be really great for an employer. Now, different things to consider when looking at job descriptions, do your research. Really take the time to research into the company's needs. What actually is it that they're looking for? What are the pain points? Take the time to look at the company's page and understand their values, their interests, and their ambitions. 
and actually think, can you provide tangible examples of how your values, interests and ambitions are aligned? Culture is as important as the technology. So start thinking as well, does your personality fit to what they describe? And then for any of the gaps that you do have on the job description, think about how you can fill them. So let's use this example. If they're a med tech organization, although you're missing the industry experience of working in a med tech company, let's say you love med technology and you have lots of different personal projects. So that's gonna fill a gap. That's gonna be really exciting regardless. So don't hold back from applying. Another example would be take certifications, online courses, projects, fill in those gaps that are missing. And more importantly, actually take the time to network. Um, the company that you want to work for, get connected with some of the developers in the organization through LinkedIn and social platforms. Don't be afraid to be really honest with them and ask them about some of the challenges they're working on. How's the working environment? And let them know that you'd love the opportunity to work for them. It's not going to work every time, but the more people you try and get connected with and do these things, the more recognized you're going to become and the more connections that you're going to make. So, as opposed to just um, hitting apply to a job description straight away, really take the time to look at these things and consider these things because this is also what's gonna set you aside to show that you've really done your research. Now, here comes your application, cover letter. Let's have a look at the harsh reality. So a quote from, again, another CTO that I work with, we receive hundreds of applications. Recruitment is a small percentage of my day. I can only invest around 30 seconds of my time on reading a cover letter. So it's important for applicants to understand they only have a few seconds to connect and capture my attention. So let's have a look at this. How can we capture attention? How can we minimize the chances of rejection? So how I say to look at an elevator, sorry, how I say to look at a cover letter is the elevator pitch. So for example, you're going into Spotify's office, let's say for argument's sake, you're on the first floor, you get into Spotify's elevator and the hiring manager for the position that you wanna work at is in that lift. You have from the first floor until the top floor of Spotify's office to sell yourself to the hiring manager on the reasons why you should work for the business. So think of your cover letter in that sense. So less is more. Make it easy to digest, use punchy language, action verbs, and really tell a story. So state a career goal or highlight your personal brand. Again, the things that you've been doing in the background that are gonna benefit the business. Relate this to the company in the position. So always go back to how you're gonna be adding value. And again, cultural fit and personality. Listen characteristics, back that up with tangible examples. These are things that hiring managers really are gonna be looking for in a cover letter and are gonna give you some personality as well. You're not a robot, right? And you want companies to know that. Let's have a look at CV. So it really is so important to tailor and change your CV for every different organization and job that you apply to. Now, I know you may be thinking, oh, it's so time consuming, it's so long winded. It is, I'm not gonna lie, but it will be benefit you so much more. Companies look at these things. So make sure it's an honest reflection of you and your experiences. And my advice to you in terms of CV, now I'm not saying this is a winning formula, but just my advice is aim to have two full pages for your CV. Use bullet points and subheadings, proofread, of course, for spelling, grammar and typos. Um, Grammarly is a really good app um, if you wanted to use something to aid you. Ensure a consistent formatting throughout. Do not be afraid to get creative with visuals, branding, you know, stand out. I know somebody that uh, made an application to a marketing position at KFC and they actually branded their CV with chicken drumsticks and made it all KFC related and they ended up getting the job. So don't be afraid to uh, spruce things up a little bit, stand out. You want people to remember you. Make it personable. Again, you're not a robot, right? And I'd recommend maybe not including things around like your skill percentage. For example, my experience is 70% JavaScript because I think this is relative and almost impossible to define accurate, 
accurately and 70% to you may be really great but they may be looking for a hundred percent and you don't want to kind of ruin your chances before you've even had the chance to speak with them now what do we look for on a CV so I always recommend at the top of your CV having a personal profile having an about me really providing an overview of who you are uh, outside of your cover letter so your personality how can you stand out from other applications maybe include a quirky quote that you live by so I've just listed one here nothing is impossible the word itself says I'm possible maybe a bit cheesy for some but it definitely works and it makes you stand out how could you add value to the position and organization why do you want to work for the organization? Again, that links back to the research that you've done from your job description uh, analytics. And list the top three soft skills that you feel you have. For example, goal-oriented. Goal but don't just list that. List a tangible example of how you are goal-oriented, what you've done to prove this. Back it up because so many people are just putting buzzwords um, and companies see through that. So list the value, list the tangible examples. Also, when it comes to employment history, go beyond listing just your job description. So anyone can almost put a shopping list of the things that they've been doing, but actually explain what you've delivered on, the value, the impact that this has created, for example, this enabled us to deliver 5% improvement on a project. Tell a story. Again, provide tangible examples. I think a really nice touch as well is underneath each uh, job that you've worked at, maybe list two or three things that you've learned from your experience there as well. And um, I'd always list temporary or voluntary work if the skills are transferable. Again, personal brand, that's something that we look for. Personal projects that you've worked on, your willingness to sharpen the knife when it comes to your skills. So are you prepared to learn? Are you prepared to go the extra mile? Also your characteristics, any hobbies and interests as well. That's always exciting because like we said, culturally we look for the right people. Like I say, relevant and unique tangible examples of all of the things that you've been doing. And also, we look at your values and how they align to our organisation. These things are really important. Here I've just listed uh, Medium because, again, this is a platform you can use to create blogs on, and that's something that also is really um, fantastic for companies. So my top tips for applying to jobs is use your network get talking to the people that you know that you don't know you know get connected like i said with them through social platforms speak to them about the challenges in their current positions um, see if you can help in any way if there's volunteering work or any projects that you can take on and also a lot of big companies actually have referral schemes for their employees if they can recommend anyone to join a business. So I'm quite confident that a lot of developers will be willing to help. Also, tailor and customize, like we said, for each individual application. Diversify, it's a numbers game. So don't just get really hung up on one specific company. You have to spread your risk. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. And use failure to fuel your success because you need resilience. Um, you're not going to get a, a response from every application you make. If you do, fantastic. But just have in mind, sometimes it is around being in the right place at the right time. But resilience is key, especially in a time like this. Keep positive, keep doing what you're doing, keep working on your personal brand. Don't let it bring you down if you do have rejections. Just learn from it. And remember, you know, JK Rowling's pitch for Harry Potter was rejected 12 times. Look at Harry Potter now. Jack Ma, who is one of the richest men in China, he failed his college entrance exam twice and was rejected from dozens of jobs, including one at KFC. These are prime examples of the power of resilience. So really try and keep positive. I know firsthand how frustrating it can be. Uh, if you ever wanted to reach out, if you ever needed advice, I'm always here. My door's always open. So interview prep, let's talk a little bit about this. Now, first things first, research. That is absolutely key. So similar to what you did on the job description, research into the organization's mission, their pain points, the challenges they're having, you know, what is it that they really need? 
research the culture, the values of the business. Again, list how that aligns to you. Also research the company um, blogs or YouTube, Glassdoor, get networking with some of the people in the company. Again, reach out. I'm actually going to be interviewing with you. I wondered if I could speak to you for a few minutes about uh, the challenges that you're working on or if you had any tips or advice. And also research the actual industry itself and the competitors, so the challenges that they're going through. Take some time to think, um, why do you actually want the job? Make sure you tailor your answer for every specific company, but really give that some thought as well. You know, is this really the company for you? Also, do not get hung up on what you can't do. Just be open and transparent. Be confident on your ability, your potential, and the achievements that you have had so far. And more importantly, just be kind, genuine, humble, and do not fear the why. Don't be afraid to ask those questions. Interaction is absolutely key. Now, I wanted to share with you some killer questions that I feel you should be asking in interviews. If you ask these already, fantastic. If not, then I hope that it can certainly add some value to you. So I always say to have in mind five key areas. So company, position, the technology and tools, the team and culture and education. And always link your questions to your motivations. For example, Earlier, we spoke about my passion for studying in my free time. What kind of employee education programs do you offer? How involved is the team in the development community? I just wanted to share with you some examples of questions that I feel you should be asking. Um, take some time to, to have a look at these, but I'll go through them with you. So the company goals, both short and long term. A day in the life at the organization. So what would be their expectations of you, let's say, for example, as an analyst? What are the current challenges that they're facing in the business, the current projects and the projects in the pipeline? Understand if you are a data analyst, you know, the volume of data that the company is working with. Also ask them directly, what is the best thing about working in the organization? Um, why did they decide to join the business? How's their journey been so far? And how does the culture and team look? Also, ask the person interviewing you, what is the best thing that they've delivered in terms of the value? So actually don't be afraid to kind of turn the, the tables a little bit. And like I say, at the end, do not be afraid to ask for feedback. So this is a big one. Based on our discussion, how well do you think I would fit into the team culture? So let's talk a bit about salary negotiation. I think there's a bit of a stigma around salary negotiation. I sat in on a really interesting webinar a few weeks back from Women in AI, and they addressed a really interesting but taboo topic, the idea that uh, naturally women slightly shy away from salary negotiations or for asking for what they feel they deserve. So my tips here would be have a mindset shift. We have to practice, we have to prepare, and we have to have strategies in place. So take the time to research, speak with people in your industry, maybe friends, colleagues, know what real looks like at your level, know how much you are worth. Believe in your strengths, believe in your ability, your potential, and have the confidence and clarity to just ask, what is the worst that can happen? Use a really great website here, which I'm sharing, and that's to compare different salary ranges as well. But always think of the bigger picture when it comes to salary negotiation, because compensation, it's not just financial, it is also about your own personal growth and development. So don't think of the next few months, think of the next few years in that organization. Okay, maybe you might get a slightly less salary, but let's say their career progression plan and their employee uh, education budget is incredible. You're gonna fast track yourself because I've seen a lot of people make a lot, a lot of mistakes with just accepting an offer that has the biggest salary. And that's not necessarily always the best option. So I wanted to share with you as well some valuable advice from the industry. These are people that I'm working quite closely with. So from a head of analytics, take the time to upskill and be proactive with this. Do not put too much pressure on yourself. And most importantly, be kind. Now, from a head of data delivery and MDM, 
Use online training and attend meetups or webcasts to meet new people in the field and to expand your horizon. And last but not least of all, dare to take a chance. You will learn anyway. I love that one. I think it's great. From a CTO, at the start of your career is a continuation of your studies. Take this time to explore, learn and discover what motivates you. You do not need to find your perfect position immediately. Always have the long game in mind. From Head of Machine Learning, nothing can stop you. If you have a passion, then just go for it. And from a head of engineering, keep yourself up to date. Do not get left behind. So I think the real common theme here in terms of how you're going to stand out and reduce those chances of rejection is really working on yourself and going that extra mile and being committed and being proactive with it. So I wanted to open the floor up now to, to any questions that we may have. Um, I think we've got a, a few minutes left. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Ellie, for your talk. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, please feel free that we have some comments here. How many questions should we ask for average? Uh, you guys have, you can ask as many questions as you have. Uh, and in case uh, some of them are unresolved, uh, we will um, answer them through our social media or with a blog post, so no worries. Sure. Uh, we have a question that uh, they ask. So um, you as a talent partner, how do you see the field for women, especially immigrants or women of color uh, in, the t in tech? Sure. I see it as a thriving industry. Now more than ever, companies are realizing that diversity plays a key part in innovation, in creativity, in productivity. So I think if you're putting yourself out there and, and networking and getting involved in the industry, attending meetups like today and working on your personal projects, you're going to stand out now more than ever for the right reasons. Organizations are really embracing diversity. And you know what? If they're not, then is that the company for you? Do you want to work in a business like that? So I think it's definitely booming and make sure that you're joining supportive networks like this one. Um, there's many others out there. Women in Tech is a great one um, where you can surround yourself by like-minded individuals that are going to encourage you. They're not going to put you down because of how you look, where you're from. They're going to support you and you may be able to learn some great things, um, but more importantly, make some friends for life along the way as well. Uh, thank you, Ellie. Uh, we have another question that is, um, do you have any tips or do you know any exercises to calm your nerves before an interview or technical test? Sure. So how I look at an interview first stage is I would really go in there with a view that it's just a conversation. It's just getting to know someone. Right. So you're just going to talk to them about the things that you're passionate about, that you believe in and the experience that you have, which you, you know a lot about. And they're going to tell you about a business that you could potentially be quite interested in. Break that stigma of this is a really tense conversation and, uh, you know, I'm really nervous and nerves are normal. That's a good thing. It shows you care. But break it down. Look at it more as a very open conversation. I'd recommend maybe before the interview going for a nice walk, clearing your mind, um, doing something that can calm you down. Um, I know for me, uh, I would probably go for a walk as well, speak to some friends to calm your nerves, get some advice. But I think break that stigma. Look at it as just a conversation, talking about things that you are truly passionate about. Okay, we have somebody who wants to make your question, so please open your mic. All right. Hi, Maria. Hi, Ali. Hi. Yeah, so I uh, currently I am pursuing my undergrad uh, in computer science majors. And um, I was asking that, what do you advise for me uh, currently a, a student? So I wish to work outside my country later because I feel that there are less opportunities for uh, women in India right now. There are like, there's a lot of competition as well, but I want to sh I want to shift to another country. So what do you think would be the best advice for me? Sure. So I think um, have a think about the countries that you'd like to 
go to and start getting connected with people through social media platforms in these countries in the technology space that you're involved with get speaking to them get talking to them about their work environment and the things that they're doing and the challenges that they're having um, so really build up a strong network in the country that you'd like to be and also start attending a lot of the online events that they're hosting as well maybe look at some initiatives um, that are running in that country that you could try and volunteer at you know reach out to the organizers and say look you know I'm really keen to relocate here um, I'd love to try and get involved in your initiative as much as I can or, or get some experience. I think really networking is going to be key in, in your case. We have, thank you so much, Ali. No problem. <laughs> thank you, Mom, for your question. Uh, we have another question here that um, they say, how, uh, hi, and could you please advise any organizations for volunteering uh, and beginner intermediate level jobs? Sure. So, I think that really is subjective to what it is that you do, um, the industries that you want to work in. But I think many organizations out there are open to that. It's just a case of, again, networking, getting connected with these people and having conversations. I think if volunteering is something that you wanted to do, maybe have a look initially at different initiatives like Pink Programming, Hack Your Future as well, and they could also put you in contact with organizations that they have partnerships with. Okay, uh, we have another question here. Um, how, how to show tangible examples of achievements when it's your first job? And this is something really related to another question that was here. Do companies actually give opportunities to junior developers when in the case you need experience to get experience so it's yeah i think if that's the case then really try and again work on your personal brand so what personal projects can you work on okay maybe you don't have the industry experience but if you can back that up back it up when you're making applications look this is what i've been doing in my free time i'm really passionate about these technologies that's going to be really interesting to organizations as well. Um, and also the things that you can heighten in on uh, transferable skills from your studies in terms of how you are as a person, your communication skills. Uh, of course, if you're applying for entry level positions, then organizations aren't going to expect you to have five years industry experience. But working on your personal brand and going that extra mile, these are all of the things that are going to make your application so much stronger and stand out if you don't have that industry experience. And we have a last question over here uh, from Saima. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, what is the rough radio uh, of men and women in your company? In my company, sure. So my company is quite small. So Digitech Search, we're only 10 people. Um, we have uh, three women um, and uh, seven guys in, in the team currently. Um, of course, hoping to, to push that and get more women in, in the business as well in our recruiting teams. Okay, uh, we have some other questions over here. Um, maybe this is the last one, guys. So uh, I'm going to ask you and we will close with this one. Uh, so how much should you know for specific technologies for a company that considers junior level? How much is, at least in years of experience or yeah. in terms of percentage, how much should a junior have? I would say junior is anything from six months, I would say, six months to a year. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ellie. Uh, thank you for being with us and answering our questions. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, next, we are going to have um, open source. So I think this is very related to what we have been talking. This is another of the ways that we can contribute to, to our curriculums and all of this. So um, this talk, the talk is called Open Source, What, Why, and Taking Your First Steps. So open source software powers many aspects of our digital life, secure internet connections, web browsers, 3D, 3D graphic rendering, and it even helps produce images uh, of black holes. 
So that's pretty cool, hey? Uh, new coders, designers, technical writers, community managers, open source really is going to provide a unique opportunity to contribute to technical projects and gain some experience uh, without even have to leave your homes. So this talk is going to introduce to the basics of what open source is, why is it important and useful, how to contribute, uh, and give your first steps in this work. And here with us is Yo. She is an open source technical lead for the Wellcome Trust, a software sustainable institute fellow. She is also the co-founder of Open Life Science, founder of Coded Science, an engineer student at the University of Manchester, studying the effects of community and usability on open source software. She is also the editor for the PLOS Open Source Toolkit, a board member of the Open Bioinformatics Foundation. And she has previously worked in the University Camp of Cambridge uh, as a software engineer and community manager for Intermine. So welcome, Yo. Hey, thank you so much. I'm so delighted to have a chance to talk today. Um, so I will just try sharing my screen. Yeah, the stage is yours. OK. Okay, can you see it? Oh, it might be still loading. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. If Fantastic. you want to start maybe presenting because yeah. we can see all. Yeah. It might be the wrong window now, I have a feeling. We are seeing all the slides kind of yeah. like it's, Okay, I'm going to stop and try again. There's always one technical hitch, right? <laughs> no worries, yeah. <laughs> Typical in technical uh workshops or sessions uh, always <laughs> absolutely right okay let me okay i think i'm sharing the right one now <laughs> thanks for bearing with me yes Awesome. Okay. So, um, like Maria said, um, so my name is Yo Yehudi, and I've worked in open source for about five years, um, although I've actually been a software engineer full time for about 10 years. And I think I wrote my first line of code probably around about 2000. So I've been doing software engineering and web development for a long time. Uh, so I will today be talking about wha what, what open source is, why it's important, and also about taking your first steps, which I think actually does build really nicely on Ellie's talk, um, because it does provide a really good way to actually get some experience, even if you haven't had your first job. Um, and it, it's a few years ago now, but I absolutely remember this frustration. I didn't have any experience and I didn't have a portfolio and I couldn't get it without getting experience. <laughs> and it's just like this catch 22 that can be really challenging sometimes. So um, I also have a document. So there's a link down there at the bottom. Hopefully you can see where it says bit.ly uh, slash open dash source dash magenta. Uh, so if you open that up, you can get uh, contact information for me. There's a link to the slides if you want to look at the slides. And I will also be asking a few questions as we go through the talk. So this will give everyone a chance just to um, write those questions down in a document together. So I'll, please do open it up, but I will show the link again later when it's important as well. Uh, so first of all, I'll talk a little bit about who I am and what I do, what my background is. Um, so that picture there is me. I'm actually visiting my family. I'm, I'm on the Mediterranean. You can literally see the beach behind me in Israel. <laughs> um, and I, at the moment, work at the Wellcome Trust, which is a large philanthropic, philanthropic trust um, based in London. They give a large amount of funding to different scientific endeavors, uh, primarily in the UK, but also in lower and middle income countries around the world. Um, and as an open source technical lead, what I do is I try to give advice on how people can take code that they write for scientific reasons and make it open source so that we can actually share the science that we're doing effectively. Um, but that's actually something that I literally started this month. So this is my fourth week in this job. Before that, for about five years, I worked at the University of Cambridge for a project called Intermine. Um, and that was an open source project that actually helped scientists look up biological data, like the results of experiments and information about genes. Um, and over that time, I started writing code. 
Um, but by the end, I actually was much more of a community manager. So I spent a lot of time interacting with people who were contributing to the code. And especially, um, I, I, it's really important to me to bring in the newbies and to make sure that people who've maybe never um, you know, made a, a public line of code in their life feel comfortable doing that and making contributions to open source code. Um, I tend to work around science and research related projects. That's why you can see things like the Journal of Open Source Software, that's a um, scientific journal, or the PLOS Open Source Toolkit. Um, but I'm also a student, so I'm actually studying as well at the moment. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's really exciting and really shiny. But I actually also put together this other slide. This is it's not something that actually happens in a day. So everyone has to start somewhere. Um, so when I first started uh, learning how to code, I think I worked at a call center. And so I was trying to sell people websites, not make them. <laughs> and no one wanted to talk to me, I've got to be honest. Um, and yeah, I did send faxes. Um, that might be giving away my age. <laughs> Um, and then I worked in tech support and eventually I finally got a degree in computing and IT but because I did it part time it meant that um, I already had a lot of work experience by the time work experience but not in coding by the time I was fully qualified. Um, I guess I, I put this here just to say that whilst I, I always will start a talk to say that I am experienced in open source and I can give advice about it, but I don't want people to feel bad or think, oh my God, I can never get like really far because everyone starts somewhere. And I think that's a really important thing to recognize and not to worry if you're only taking your first steps. Uh, so anyway, I'll get on a bit with what the um, topic that I'm going to be talking about, which is what is open source? So I would actually like to see, um, get some opinions and ask the audience on this one. So if you visit the HackMD link, so this is the bit.ly link, and I think Maria posted it also in the chat. Uh, so you'll need to click edit to edit in the HackMD, and then it should pop up a pane on the left. Uh, and there's a question just asking, what is open source? So if ever, anyone wants to just hop over to that window, I'm just going to literally mute for a couple of minutes while everyone types out ideas about what you think open source might be. Uh, and don't worry, there's no wrong answers, and it will just give me a bit of an idea and a bit of things that we can discuss about this. I will hop over there as well. Feel free to also write some of those answers if you're not able to, if you're maybe connected from your phone, uh, you can give them on through our chat. Uh, feel free to do that. Thanks, Maria. That's a really great suggestion. Uh, I'm liking what I'm seeing coming in at the moment, actually. Uh, and also slightly amused by the um, facts that still exist. Yeah, some countries it's a lot more common. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, feel free to keep on typing, uh, but I'm going to move on just so there isn't too much dead air with people thinking, goodness, when's she going to move on? Uh, so um, I would look at some of the answers that we have here. People talk about contributing to a company um, like broken code saying, hey, there's a problem here. Maybe you can fix it. Or maybe that's someone actually fixing the issue, either reporting it or fixing it. Those are both parts of open source. Uh, Alejandra says public code available for anyone to use, maintained by volunteers. Um, so some, sometimes that's true. In fact, very often it's true. 
I actually, for the last five years, was paid to write open source code. But that is a very, very lucky thing. So very often, organizations are run on a shoestring with not a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, open code base modified by the community. So, yep, that's another one. Community uh, improving things. That seems to be a common theme as we look along. Uh, free code available to the public for all types of use. And that's also true. Open source generally means um, one of the requirements is that you cannot restrict the way it gets used. And in some ways, that has ethical problems. Uh, for example, in dictatorial countries, I believe, for example, that uh, Korea has um, a version of Linux that they have modified so that they can use to monitor people. So sometimes open is maybe even a bit too open, but that is within the realms of open source. Um, and <laughs> I'm curious, Yoha, you said open source is a nice community of little ants. Um, I'm not sure why, uh, how ants will be contributing to the source code, but it sounds interesting. Uh, anyway, I will go back to my screen, um, if I can find my other screen. There we go. OK, so I put some answers about what open source isn't, first of all. Uh, so actually, open source sometimes isn't free. Uh, so it's possible that people might create free software where the source code isn't available. Um, and that wouldn't be open source. And equally, it's possible that people could create open source software where actually they charge money. Um, because pe to be fair, people need to make a living. So people try and find different business models around open source code. Uh, so they are often the same thing, but not always so. And what I would define it is, is um, sharing the design that you, for your work in a way that it can be reused and remixed by others. And then I have a little star saying, for software, it also needs the open source license. Um, and that means, for example, if you have written some code, let's say uh, you've written a pretty library that makes um, someone's CSS look really nice, for example, some sort of uh, styling framework. If you put that on GitHub, but you don't actually give a license, to the code, then it's actually illegal for people to reuse the code. Um, so even though it, it can often be a really quick thing, like it, GitHub makes it 30 seconds to add an open source license, it's something that you can't forget if you actually want people to legally reuse what you're doing. Um, and there are great resources on the web, like choosealicense.com, that can provide advice on how to choose one of these and why you might choose one license over the other. Because if you look up open source licenses, there's hundreds of them, and they have all sorts of little different rules about them. Um, but there are guides, so it makes it easier to figure that out. Um, my main advice is have one, uh, rather than any specific, uh, any specific license that you might add for an open source project. Um, and now I'll move a little bit on to that second question. I think some of you have already started filling that out. But um, now that we have a bit of a definition of open source, that it's this collaborative code that people work on together, I uh, would like to just get people's opinions to whether or not it's important. And if not, why not? Or if yes, why do you think it is important? Uh, so I'll just uh, go, go on quiet for a minute whilst we just type the second question into the HackMD document. And uh, like Maria mentioned, that it's also OK to uh, post it in the chat here if you don't have access to the HackMD. That's fine, too. OK, there's already quite a lot of answers in there. Um, so like before, I feel free to keep on adding them in. But I will just sort of um, go through some of what we have. Um, it's fine to keep on typing. Uh, so we have one saying uh, that open source is important because it builds your skills, how to do pull requests, and adding your work to an organization. Absolutely. I would agree with that one. Uh, learning how to contribute and sometimes the different rules that you may have contributing to a community can be really useful. And even if you later work at a company where things aren't open source, uh, learning those sorts of methods is still likely to be beneficial because no matter what, you're going to have to collaborate with others on your code. Um, and then we have it allows to learn, develop the open source projects further. And oftentimes, it's free. Absolutely. It's giving back to the community is another really special and amazing thing that you can do. 
Um, and actually, Ali was talking about how having hobby projects can be really helpful for your CV. Um, and this is exactly that. It's you, if you're contributing on GitHub, then actually suddenly um, your profile has these pre pretty little green squares, or it could be GitLab, or there's other places you can contribute open source code as well. But at the end of the day, it's stuff that you can boast about. And you know, if you have time to do that, then that's an amazing thing to do. And uh, from machine, we have you get experience and learn from others. And also, it's improving and upkeeping stuff for free. Um, building network, yep, another great one. And again, this is something that Ali was mentioning, that um, building up your network with others is a great way to help you get jobs and break into the industries that you might be interested in. Um, and Alejandra points out that a lot of great projects are supported by open source. I think this is so important. Like under every single website, just about, there will be open source technology. It's very rare that a website doesn't have some sort of um, server or, or framework that runs open source code. And so it does seem fair, especially if you're working for a large organization, to, um, to make sure that you're giving back as well and you support the people who are supporting you. Uh, Virginie, you've said it allows to get ideas from everywhere, and I absolutely agree. The more people who are in an open source community, the more people you can learn from, and they're also learning from you. Um, and that's really important. Like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen videos of um, sensors that were designed for hand washing, and they uh, were only ever tested with people with really light skin, and then sometimes people with darker skin, they wouldn't be detected. And it's sort of like, well, if they'd had a more diverse community and a bigger community when they were doing these things, then we would have picked up these things. So once again, the, the, the more people contributing uh, from different areas, the better it's going to be. Uh, learning can be boosted when it's shared learning, um, definitely. And it allows people to not reinvent the wheel. Yes, it's absolutely true. If everyone is not sharing what they're doing, then we're probably doing the same thing just privately and we're wasting a lot of time and effort. So I, I love this list. It's been a really great list of different reasons why open source can be really valuable to the world, to ourselves, and to others. And um, so there's all sorts of different reasons why it can be important. So now I will switch back to... Right, so these are some of the reasons that I prepared earlier um, when I was thinking why open source might be useful. So one is to prove your experience, um, which I think we've covered a little bit, that if you don't have much experience in the industry, then it's really nice to have this GitHub profile and you can say, here, look, here's the code I wrote. You can see how awesome it is. Um, you know, and so having that shared openly is a lot easier than if you're at a company and you cannot actually show that to people. Um, and another one that I encountered actually, so about 10 years ago, I used to work for a mattress website. It's not very exciting, but you know, I wrote code uh, to sell mattresses. <laughs> Um, and then they redesigned the website and suddenly all my work was gone after I left. And it's like, oh no, I mean, I can say I worked on it and people have to hopefully believe me, but I have absolutely no proof because all of the designs and all of the code that I put in is gone. And if you put something on GitHub, people can't take it away from you. Um, you know, and that's a really nice and special thing. So actually on the right, this is a screenshot for my GitHub profile. And because my whole job, my paid money was actually to write open source code, you can see every single time that I've pushed something and you can see that I've done a lot of work. And that's, that's really nice. That's you know, something people can't take away from me like when it's closed source. And some other reasons, these are more general reasons, perhaps why open source might be useful. Um, and so I think we actually already had exactly this phrase in the HackMD, no one should have to reinvent the meal. Um, you don't want people to have to write the same stuff twice, share it, and then we can build on each other's shoulders rather than competing. Um, and then the, another one that I think we had on the HackMD as well was share your work and others will share back. You know, it's nice to share with one another. Decentralization, um, if this may be a harder argument, but it's nice to be able to customize things. You know, you can't customize Google, for example. Um, and documentation is one that I think is a massive bonus. And if something is closed source, you probably should have documentation, but you might not. If it's an open source project that people are contributing to, you're going to be answering questions all the time if you don't have documentation. Um, and if I write code and I come back to it six months later, I won't remember what I've done. So I will always be happy and thank past me if I've written documentation. So maybe it's an excuse to write documentation, if nothing else. <laughs> 
Um, and another reason is that open source does amazing things. So I think it was like maybe a year ago that we woke up and on the news they were saying, we've made the first scientific image of a black hole. But what's really cool is that that was, um, that was open source software. That was scientists who took other software other people have created and made their own open source. And I don't know, I think it's really exciting to think that we can do these things, like make images of black holes really far away. Um, that's pretty cool. So that brings me on to my next step. So now that we've said a bit about what open source is and we've talked about why it might be important, I would just like to start talking about what you do when you want to start contributing. So I'll start talking about some of the little things and then I'll start talking about some of the bigger ways that you can get involved as well. Uh, so it's third question time. Um, so once again, I will mute, we'll hop over to the HackMD and feel free to add any answers if you haven't answered the third question yet. Okay, some of the answers we have in here are um, great. And yeah, keep on typing, definitely. If you're still typing, I'm not intending to interrupt. Um, but I can see there's, there's sort of a mixture. There's people saying, yeah, I'm contributing right now. Um, and there's other people saying, I want to, but maybe I'm a bit scared or I have no idea where to start and I feel yeah. I Whilst I'm here as like the open source expert, I, until people paid me money to start open source, I did not know how. And that is part of the reason that I like to give these talks because I want to encourage people so that they can figure out how to take these steps and that it doesn't have to be so hard to break in. Uh, and then there's also people saying it was scary or they were overwhelmed um, and they're basically sad, but it is something that happens. Um, and you can find different communities. So sometimes some communities are nicer than others and there are little signs that I think you can look for to try and spot the ones that perhaps are friendlier and nicer. So I'll try and mention a couple of those in a minute. Um, and oh gosh, one, one question in here, is an all green GitHub, GitHub important? I will say no, please don't strive for that. Look after yourself first. Uh, so this is just referring to like the graph I had where you can see loads of white spots everywhere. And occasionally I was committing on the weekend, but usually that was something small. Um, so it's important to walk a line, I think a balance between um, having stuff to show to other people and looking after yourself. And I think it's also important, good organizations will recognize that you are a human being and that you do not have to work 24 seven in order to um, impress people. Um, and yeah, um, I've lost my track. <laughs> okay, oh, Yoha, I like your example there. Um, so Yoha, is, she, she contributed to um, the organization I used to work for. And it's lovely to hear that it was super cool. <laughs> um, anyway, I will go back to my slides because otherwise I will lose track about what I was saying. But I'm loving some of the answers we have here. And I'm also a little sad that sometimes it is hard, but I, it is definitely a fact that that's sometimes how it is. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about just dipping your toes into open source, making the little steps, the first steps, even if you're not sure you know enough, there are ways to do it. As long as you can write a little bit of code or you can follow instructions, you'll probably be fine. So uh, dipping your toes in one step at a time. And ha how many of you have heard of Hectoberfest? And how? Well, there's no real way for me to measure that, so I will. <laughs> Maybe some of you have, maybe some of you haven't. Um, Hectoberfest is actually a really awesome initiative and we are at exactly the right time of year to start thinking about it. Um, so Hectoberfest is an initiative where people um, can make pull requests on GitHub, that is make contributions to an open source project. If you make five, and they have to be genuine uh, contributions, they can't be spammy like, you know, I've just changed one full stop or, something, but if they are genuine contributions, they don't have to be huge, but they have to be real. 
uh, then you get a free t-shirt and it is surprisingly good at pulling people in and helping people teach their first steps because organizations think hey this is great I'm going to get some new contributors and they sit down and they curate issues um, and they think well here's a nice easy issue that I can have or here's one that's a little bit harder but um, you know I have step-by-step -step guidance on how to do it and so there will be a huge wealth of different issues that you can contribute to during October and we're nearly in September, so we're nearly in October. And um, so, I mean, it's time to start thinking about, look at GitHub um, and have a think what sort of issues you might be interested in um, and start making the first steps. So, yeah, that sums it up. I think it's five pull requests. It used to be four. Um, I'm assuming it'll be five again this year, but they haven't actually said yet. If you're interested in learning more, then there's this link here, hectoberfest.digitalocean.com. There's also a link at the bottom of the HackMD document that you can click on. Ah, and Maria's added it to the um, chat as well. Thank you so much. Um, but take a look. Um, I will talk a little bit more about uh, ways to make get, get started, but this is one of the great ways to, um, like great, great initiatives, it's a great time of year to be doing it, I think. Um, another one is the first time is only guide. So if you go to firsttimeisonly.com, that is literally when people curate issues that are really, really tiny, usually. Like, so if I was writing a first timer issue, my rule of thumb is that it would take me longer to write up what you need to do in the issue than it would to actually um, fix it myself. So this could be, let's say, oh, I want that text to be bold or I want that text to be read. And the point is not that I'm looking for people to make massive changes in, in my code base, but actually that I'm looking to meet people and to get contributors and to help them take their first steps. Because when you, if you've never used GitHub before, then you might, you might not know how to make a pull request or you might not know how to make a Git commit. Um, and if people are willing to walk you through that step, then you want to have the code not be the thing you're worrying about. <laughs> Um, and so people can also mark things up with things like, um, if you see there, there's no up for grabs or first time is only. There's a few different, um, what's the word I'm looking for, tags that are on GitHub for issues that are designed for real beginning newcomers. And they are a great way to find your first contribution. Uh, and some of the things that you might want to look for in a community. So this is a, an example of a an issue that I wrote up for Intermine that was designed to be for a first time contributor. Uh, so this is a Python repository. And what I've asked for is for people to just run, um, to run a formatter on the code and then check the code back in. So they don't actually need to make any changes. It'll often just be stuff like changing the indents on a file before checking it back in. Um, and then if you look down, I have step by step what you need to do to actually get started. So I have, first of all, look at our contribution guidelines. And so we have a set of guidelines that you can read, that you can walk through, and you can get an idea of what you need to be doing. Um, and then just the simple steps. So comment on this issue saying that you're going to work on it. And so that just sort of like stakes it as your claim. And then once you're ready, you can add your work to the repository and create a pull request. Actually, there's a bunch of technical steps just inside that one. But the important thing is that I also add my contact details at the bottom. So if you want to contact me to ask for help, then I can walk you through those. And other, other organizations will curate, curate issues in a similar way if they really want to, to bring on those newcomers and make it really easy for them to get started. Um, and if it just says, oh, there's a bug, we want to fix it, that might not be a thing you want to start with. Look for the ones that are really well described and really step by step and there's guidelines. Um, so here's another example. These are the contributor guidelines from Intermine where I used to work. And we have a lot of information. Some of this is just be nice to one another. Uh, please be patient because the people who are merging your code may have other things going on. So for you, like this is the most important and exciting thing. Like, oh my God, I'm going to be making a contribution. But if they have five people asking that, or you know, they have meetings that day, it may take people a bit longer to respond than you'd hope. So sometimes it's important to be patient, but also then to remind them and say, "Poke, do you remember that I'm alive?" Um, so trying to walk this line between being patient and not letting people forget about you is is um, an important skill, I guess. <laughs> Um, and also it's just information about um, like how to get help and the sort of behavior and the guidelines that you should expect. 
and lots of pro lots of projects will have this. So if you go to a GitHub repository, look and see if it has a contributing.md in the files, and that will usually be in the root of the repository. And if you can see a contributing.md, that means that they have guidelines. They have an explanation for how you should get started with the contributions, and they may point you towards the types of issues that you should be getting started with. Um, if they don't have it, it might mean that they are open to contributions, but they're not aware that it, you know, creating these files can help. But um, the ones who do are usually more likely to be receptive to new pull requests. And, and here's another contributing guidelines uh, repository that I think is really, really good. So this is the Turing Way. It is a guide for how to do really good data science. Um, and you can see they're contributing.md file here and um, they've got emoji they're like hey we're excited you're here we want you to contribute um, and once again this is a sort of community that you probably do want to be be getting involved with because they're really friendly and they're helpful and they show the easy ways to get in touch and they also actually the Turing way is a particularly good one because they have um, these collaboration cafes where um, they literally just have a zoom call open for like a couple of hours and you can just pop by and say hi I'm going to be working on this issue I need a bit of help or even just like to meet people and chat with them and that happens like several times a week so that it's always really easy to get to know and to contribute to this community uh, and Movika Sharan who um, is the community manager is one of my best friends so she's maybe why I'm shouting for this but <laughs> anyway I'm really proud of it um, so another great thing that uh, is really important to look for when you are contributing to open source is look for a code of conduct. So actually, I was delighted when um, one of the first things that happened on the Magenta Co's call was mentioning the code of conduct and the fact that we need to respect one another um, and treat one another the way that we'd like to be treated. Um, and the reason that can be useful is I don't know if anyone has ever heard, but some, some open source projects have bad reputations for being mean or for um, like, so Linux is one of the examples of an operating system that is open source. It's been around for ages. Uh, it's made by Linus Torvald. He also made Git. So he, he, he's like kicked off half of the open source world on his own. Um, but, but my point being that the reason that he named Git Git, he named it after himself. He recognizes that he's not a nice guy. <laughs> um, and you shouldn't have to put up with that crap. So some, some people won't be nice in open source communities. And there's two pathways. One is leave that community entirely. Um, or the other one is if there's someone who has a code of conduct, then you can report that and say, hey, this isn't the sort of thing that should be tolerated. Um, but if there's a community that already has a code of conduct, it's sort of a signal that they care about treating you nicely and that they want this to be a happy and friendly community. And they probably care about the values that you may care about as well. So I would treat a code of conduct as a sign that probably there's something good going on in this community. And the other thing that I would look for is, is there a way to report problems? Uh, so for example, if people have a code of conduct, but they don't actually have, uh, let's say an email address or a form to report things, then it may be that they're not actually as worried as they look about it, because if there's nothing to do, there's no way to enforce it, then it might as well not be there just about. Um, and once again, if you look on the root of many GitHub repositories, code of conduct.md may be right there in some of the, some communities, especially some of the better ones. Um, so those are some of my tips, I think, for, for spotting the, the, the good communities and the friendly ones. Um, but if you think, OK, well, maybe I've tried this out. I've done Hectoberfest, or I've tried some of these first timers only issues. And it went all right. But I would like to dive in. I want to learn more. Um, so I will talk about some of the other things that take a bit longer uh, than, than a five pull requests or a first time or only issue might take. Um, so Google Summer of Code is one. This is good for students. Um, so they only recruit students and you have to provide proof that you are a student. Um, but if you are in the Northern Hemisphere and you have a summer break at the normal time of year, which right now is not as reliable as it has been in previous years thanks to the pandemic, um, but nonetheless, uh, it, it is a nice way to have a summer job that gives you experience in code and also experience working with an open source organization and get paid for it. So that's three great things. Um, so there's some other difficult parts. For example, if you're in the southern hemisphere, your school year probably doesn't work in the same way. And it may be either really hard or impossible for you to have a break at the same time as everyone else in the northern hemisphere is having a summer break. Um, but it's still it's pretty good if it is a program that fits for you. 
Um, and so I spent four years being a mentor and organization admin for a Google Summer of Code, so taking on Google Summer of Code interns. So I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, and some of the value exchanges I'll just talk about briefly. So interns get paid for three months. You learn about interacting with open source, uh, learning the norms and the behaviors that you may get. You get three months of experience on your GitHub profile. I cannot um, emphasize enough how good having that is. Um, and it's potential recommendations for future jobs. So I have given a lot of recommendations to students who went on to look uh, to grad school, for example, for um, masters or PhDs, as well as people who wanted just to get another job. And um, I could now vouch that they were, in fact, awesome. <laughs> um, and then the organization that is running this benefits because they get three months of project work from diverse viewpoints that they might not otherwise see. Um, and they also have the potential of adding interns to the recruitment pool. Um, so it's something that benefits both sides. And actually, it's Google that pays for it. So the organization in question who is actually mentoring you through this um, doesn't have to shell out a dime, which can be very, very helpful for them if they're a small organization. Or like we mentioned earlier, a lot of open source organizations don't have money. So there's no way they could pay for this on their own in some cases. Uh, and how Google Summer of Code works is you apply in February or March, um, you have a short community bonding period, three months of coding, and you have evaluations three times. So after a month, they'll say, yeah, you're awesome, have some money and move on to the next month. Or there's a potential that you could fail, but hopefully your mentors will have been discussing this with you early on, and that should never come as a surprise. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's very worthwhile. And the other initiative that I wanted to talk about is um, to address this issue that open source software developers are usually white and they're usually guys. Um, and that's, that's not the only story. And I think we need to try and make it better. And when I say we, I mean every single person in open source. I don't think that this is a burden on the people who are coming in. I think that this is open source's problem to fix. Um, luckily, there is a fantastic organization called Outreachy. And they also provide internships, but they're a bit better in some ways than the Google Summer of Code ones. So you don't have to be a student. You can be anyone who is underrepresented or faced bias or discrimination in some way to apply for outreachy. So that means, I mean, you could be a mother who is returning after 20 years off who wants to break into the coding industry. You could be someone who is of age, gender, or sexuality that's discriminated against. You could be someone who's a different color from the people who work in open source most of the time. Um, but any of those are reasons to apply for outreachy. And it, well, like Google Summer of Code, it is three months where you get paid to do your work in a, an open source organization. Um, and it doesn't have to be code as well. And I think it's really important to recognize that software isn't just code. Uh, so software can be UX, it can be design, it can be documentation, and it can be community management. And those are all valid and valuable types of contributions uh, into the tech industry. And um, I think sometimes they are undervalued. Um, so Outreach also runs twice a year, which is the other thing. So if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, your summer break will actually coincide with the other time it runs. Uh, which is a bit fairer, I think. Um, and so I actually wanted to also share some real life stories that I have about open source contributors. Uh, so this is the Google Summer of Code cohort that worked with my organization in 2017. We had five students who worked with us. And the next year, we brought our student on to be a mentor. So this time she got a small stipend and she was actually teaching people how to be open source. Even the previous year, she, we'd been the ones teaching her and helping her write the code. And 2019, it gets even more exciting. We have more students and we have a lot more mentors who we've brought back in. So, so this can be an ongoing um, opportunity, I suppose, is the way of looking at this because you're potentially getting paid and you are learning new skills like mentoring and teaching people rather than just coding on your own. Um, and then 2020, my team actually, we didn't do Google Summer of Code, we did do Outreachy, and it begins to look messy. And I have to say, having a messy graph because there's so many people mentoring each other is like my life goal. <laughs> um, but it was really amazing, the number of different networks we were building. Um, and there's even more to this, actually. So if you look here, all of these names that are highlighted in orange are people that we have uh, brought on later as interns or as staff members. Uh, or they've flown over to Cambridge and they met us in the office. Adrian on the top left, um, he was my colleague for the last year. Um, so he actually joined from GSOC and then became a colleague. 
Arunan was the JSOC, um, when I said JSOC, sorry, that is Google Summer Code. He was our uh, mentor. So he was a an organization administrator. So he did a lot of the technical things about recruiting interns. Nupur was an intern with us. Ankit uh, came and visited us in Cambridge, um, as did Nikhil. And so basically, this is the chance for ongoing um, involvement and even employment with a lot of organizations. And actually, someone who's not shown here, who was a Hectoberfest contributor, it was another one of my colleagues that the first thing he did was he made one pull request in October 2018 and he has worked from for my old company now for over a year you know so I mean obviously not every interaction like this will result in a job but that doesn't mean it's a non-zero option you know it can happen um, and so I think I'm actually wrapping up now so I just wanted to say that open source is more than just a license or more than just a code on github it is so many different things that can be happening so there's community there may be mailing groups there may be social media you know there should be documentation and that's something that you can contribute to that's just as valuable as writing code um, sharing your code interacting with other people in talks and conferences and internships there are so many different aspects to open source um, and I think that's everything I had to say. Um, are there any questions? I'll just check the HackMD first of all. Yes, we have some questions there. Uh, I don't know if you guys, if you, you want to um, tackle them, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> sure, yeah, I guess I can see one from Siema how to start in something you're interested in contributing to. Um, I hope I sort of address that towards the second half of the talk. Um, but also, I'm happy to have a half hour chat at any point if you want some advice about a really specific thing that you're interested in. Because um, yeah, I know it can be scary and hard to figure out the first step sometimes. And Varvara, you ask, are there any projects where the beginners can be helpful? Um, and yeah, that's definitely, definitely the case. I would point you back to the first timers only. Um, I think that that is a great way to find the beginner helpful sorts of um, issues. And at Hectoberfest, there will be more than at any other given time. <laughs> yes, uh, well, we have a, uh, people are uh, through our chat are sharing their profiles of Instagram and LinkedIn. So that's a great thing to keep us connected and network. Um, somebody, Sonia, has a uh, talk about um, she has applied to of Richie, and then she, if somebody has any questions or wants to talk about the, the application, feel free to ping her. Uh, do we have any more questions? Oh, oh well, no, we had a, if the GitHub green was important, but you already tackled that. <laughs> So yeah, I guess that uh, you have solved over all of our questions personally. I'm now super excited to to try and contribute to open source. Uh, we have a question here that is: Is there a group for a uh, IoT projects? Where can where can we find them? That is a really good question. Um, my inclination would be to try um, just search Google, um, not Google, GitHub for an IoT and see if there's an IoT tag. Or maybe try and combine that, like IoT and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh yeah, um, and like first timers only or Hectoberfest. Um, another thing that might be interesting in looking at is the open hardware projects. So if you if you Google open hardware, um, so open hardware is really similar to open source software. Um, it has a few differences though. For example, um, open source hardware, you have to think about what sort of materials that you are making. Um, so, for example, you don't want to have plutonium in the things that you're making because even though that's open source, it's not accessible to anyone. Um, so there's, there's, there's other aspects around open hardware, um, but it, it is basically the same thing about sharing your designs and making them cheap and making them repairable, which is actually a really important thing because like, I, I know I couldn't fix my washer, right? You'd have to get a repair tech in. And it would be really amazing if actually I could, I don't know, 3D print a replacement piece when something broke down. And that's sort of the spirit behind open hardware that we can repair and control our own devices, which is something that right now we very often can't do. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, well, we have somebody else, Emma. Uh, she's phrasing you, and if you're taking graduate students under your wing at any point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm in a weird place. So it used to be my answer for that was absolutely 100% yes, because I would be taking on outreachy interns and I would be taking on Google Summer of Code interns. Um, I don't work there anymore, uh, so I can't say for sure what my whether that will be in the future of my job. I kind of hope so because one of the most exciting things that I've ever had was like watching people grow. And uh, like I mentioned, that graph where you can see people mentoring people, mentoring people, and it makes me feel so proud watching people learn how to in get involved with the open source communities. Uh, what I can say is that where I work. Um, uh, so I work at the Wellcome Trust. We do have a graduate program. Uh, I don't know the specifics of that because I haven't looked at it yet. I've, uh, like I mentioned, I've actually only been there a few weeks. Um, but it's probably a good place to look. And actually, even looking at, um, if you are a graduate, then um, <laughs> that may be enough to get you like UK visas, for example. So I think you have to at least have a bachelor's usually to make the visa a little bit easier. So that's something to consider. Um, but yeah, ping me. I, my, my contact details are all on the HackMD. I would be happy to discuss this with a bit more. Oh, you're even here. Okay, that makes it even easier. Um, yeah, ping me. I would love to chat about that and see if I can find out some info about the graduate student program at Welcome um, based in London, although I haven't been there into the office yet because, you know, pandemic. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you so much, Jo. Thank you so much, everyone who, who shared their questions for this talk. Um, so we want just to do some closing remarks. Uh, again, thanking our both um, speakers today. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, right now, we want to also invite you to our next meetup. Um, our next session will be about web development in JavaScript. So maybe if you're interested, also a beginning in JavaScript, it, we will have some talks about it. Uh, all the information and confirmated speakers will be soon in our social media and our meetup group. So feel free to join and check that out. Uh, also remember that feedback is really important for us. So in, our, in the meetup group, we will also have some links for some uh, surveys that you can fill um, and let us know if you are interested in any more subjects, uh, if you know somebody who wants to uh, give a talk or you want to give a talk, uh, please let us know. We are always looking for uh, talented people who are looking to share their story, beginners, intermediate or expert levels. Um, and last but not least, uh, we want to thank the organizer team, uh, Johanna, Dunia, and Luisa for uh, everything to make this happen. Uh, our speakers, again, for sharing, sharing their knowledge. Ellie, Yo, thank you so much. And you guys are attendees, uh, this amazing community who wants to uplift women, amplify their voices, and see more of us in the technology and contribute to gender equality in all the STEM fields. So thank you so much. Uh, please. Stay safe, uh, suggest more ideas, share